humans have accomplished wonders on Earth. Our penetrating vision is unveiling the mysteries of nature. We are endlessly watching the world around us. The seers of the Upanishads carefully studied this attribute of human nature thousands of years ago. They observed that all our sensory organs open outwardly, hence by nature, we are bound to always seek outwards. As a result, our mind and intellect always remain entangled in the external world. The changes of the world keep us oscillating between pleasure and pain. Modern scientific accomplishments have failed to give us lasting happiness. But the sages of ancient India invented a unique technique of keeping the mind free and peaceful. This technique is documented in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. The Yoga Sutras are like the compilation of answers of an inquiring mind. It opens with the aphorism, now begins the exposition of yoga. The question arises, what is yoga? Yoga is the cessation of the changing modes of chitta consciousness. The next question one may ask, what is the benefit of practicing yoga? Through yoga, the seer abides in his own self. Does that mean we dwell in some other form? Throughout our lives, we identify ourselves with the changing modes of Chitta Consciousness. Do we live in changing modes of consciousness throughout our lives? Do we never ever know our own true self? What a tragedy it would be that we know the whole world and not know our own self. So what is our real nature? Patanjali describes the layers that cover the self and provides techniques to uncover them. Who was Patanjali? What was the nature of Yoga Shastra which he propounded? What was the nature of Yoga before Patanjali? What form did it take after Patanjali? Is the history of yoga linked to the history of religion and faith? Or is it the story of an honest effort by man to conquer disease, old age and death? We seek the answers with our journey into India's 6,000 years of known history. The story of philosophy on which the Indian mind is based is a story of India itself. It is generally believed that Patanjali was from the Nag tribe. He was the writer of three treatises, Vyakran Mahabhashya, Yoga Sutras and Ayurved Samhita. With Yoga Shastra, he eliminated the impurities of the mind. Through grammar, he eliminated the impurities of speech and through his composition on Ayurved, the ailments of the body. If it is true that all these three Shastras were composed by a single man, Patanjali, then we can say he was certainly an extraordinary genius. Here is the famous fort of Chittor, which finds a small connection with sage Patanjali. In his composition on grammar, Patanjali gives an illustration. Madhyamika is being surrounded by the Greeks. Madhyamika was the ancient name of Chittor. Greek warriors surrounded the fort of Chittor between 184 to 148 BC. This illustration suggests that Patanjali may have lived during the time of King Pushyamitra Shung. Also, an inscription on the rock edict says that Patanjali performed a yagya for King Pushyamitra Shung. Very little else is known about his life. A 
Amazingly, the Yoga Sutras that Patanjali wrote could be fitted onto one single page. This is his complete work on yoga, which was later elaborated by Maharishi Vyas. It is not known when the tradition of yoga came into existence, but on the basis of Sankhya philosophy, Patanjali compiled the sutras with precise classifications, sequences, and logic. In the history of mankind, Patanjali is perhaps the first one who demystified the elements of consciousness and arranged them scientifically. Ancient Indians had applied a unique technique for seeking knowledge. Here, the experimentation, testing and observation were not performed externally, but inside the human body and mind. It was believed all that exists in the human body, the same exists in the universe. So for acquiring knowledge, the use of telescope, microscope or chemicals was not required. Instead, the observer himself became like a telescope and a microscope. It was believed that if the chitta consciousness of the observer is focused, pure and peaceful, his vision would also become clear and focused. The process of concentrating the chitta consciousness is yoga. Therefore, yoga in India left its mark on many philosophies, arts and sciences. But the concentration in yoga has a specific purpose. The way Ayurveda cures the diseases of the body, the same way yoga alleviates the disease of the mind, suffering. There are four chapters in Yoga Shastra. The first is Samadhipad. This chapter is meant for highly evolved practitioners. Here, various techniques and progressive dimensions of yogic concentrations are mentioned. After prolonged practice of concentration with total detachment, the state of self-realization is attained. The wisdom of the state is called Ritambhara Pragya. It is beyond the intellect. In fact, it removes the impressions of intellect. This state of Samadhi cannot be achieved through ordinary wisdom. So the ordinary person has to start with yoga from the second chapter, Sadhanpad. Here, eight limbs of yoga are explained sequentially. Restraint, discipline, posture, regulation of breath, withdrawal, concentration, meditation, and samadhi. Yamas are five, non-violence, truth, non-stealing, non-possession, and celibacy. Niyamas are also five, cleanliness, contentment, austerity, recitation, and reverence for God. Patanjali saw God as a means for the cessation of the mind. He did not see God as the creator, destroyer, or operator of the universe. He was just a unit of consciousness which is free from the bondages of nature, Prakriti. The theory of yoga is Sankhya, which is atheist in nature. The priests of those times opposed it and tried to infuse elements of religion into it. Religion demands faith, but yoga is entirely existential, experiential, and experimental. The seeker, by controlling and regularizing his daily conduct through yam and niyam, sits in an asan. Asan is a comfortable and pleasant posture of the body. The body should not move. The vision should either be on the tip of the nose or the center of the eyebrows or at a target point. When one practices an asan for several hours, the body becomes steady and the chitta consciousness is rested in the infinite. On acquiring stability, the seeker then regulates the breath and when the breath becomes subtle, that is pranayam. Pranayam purifies the mind and also cleanses the channels of energy. By making the breath subtler, the most hyperactive mind can also be controlled. After pranayam, the practice of withdrawing the mind from external objects and focusing it inwardly is practiced. Our life is nurtured through the sensory experiences of speech, touch, vision, taste and smell, known as ahar. The reversal of this process 
by withdrawing the senses from the external and taking ahar from within is known as pratyahar. The inner journey of yoga begins from here. When the mind gets intermittently stabilized at any one point, that is known as dharna. The point of concentration can either be an object, real or abstract, or a thought. When dharna gets prolonged, it becomes dhyana. When dhyana gets extended further, it results in samadhi. Samadhi is the purest and steady state of being. Patanjali was not the discoverer of yoga. Where did it all begin? Traditionally, it is believed that Sankhya is the oldest philosophy of India. The Mahabharata also describes Sankhya and yoga as Sanatan philosophies, that which have been in existence forever. But who was the first yogi? The name that resonates from the farthest end of Indian thought is that of Sage Kapil, the originator of Sankhya, the greatest achiever of yoga. In the Gita, Yogi Krishna declares, amongst the highest achievers, I am Kapil Muni. People believe that no one ever perfected yoga like Sage Kapil. But there are problems regarding the historical evidence of Kapil's existence. Therefore, let us begin the history of yoga from here. The figure of this 5,000-year-old seal appears to be that of a yogi in meditation. With respect to time and geographical area, the Indus Valley was the oldest and largest civilization on Earth. Evidence of this yogi seal is found all over its biggest settlements. Surprisingly, the animals mentioned in these mantras of the Rig Veda are the same as depicted in the Harappa seal. Pushpati, who is the father of the Pita, and who is the father of the Pita, is the father of the Pita, and who is the father of the Pita. You can easily visualize Shambhavi Mudra in these twilight eyes. Because here on this Harappa bust, the Shambhavi Mudra is clearly visible. This statue was created 2,000 years after the Harappa civilization. Here also the mother goddess is shown with three faces and seated in a yogic asana. In the present time also, Women of this area wear similar bangles. If we consider the role of women at the center of Harappa civilization and this seal to be that of Mother Goddess, then there is a strong possibility that Harappa society was matriarchal. The legendary 19th century Indian philosopher and writer Bankim Chandra Chatterjee writes, the sound of the drummers of the Durga festival reminds us of the Sankhya philosophy what made him think so? Let's understand Sankhya, the philosophy of yoga. The ancient texts state that Sankhya and yoga are one. If Sankhya is the theory, yoga is its practice. Sankhya means accurate knowledge. Coincidentally, Sankhya also means numbers. To put it simply, it is a philosophy of the elements of nature in which the conscious entity is entangled. For the disentanglement of the self, the Sankhya philosophers used to meditate on the elements of nature. Sankhya considers two basic constituents in every living being, primal nature and conscious entity. Primal nature is known as Prakriti. Prakriti is the equilibrium of three basic elements, Sattva, Raj and Tam. The conscious entity is known as Purusha, Pur meaning limits or boundary, and Sha meaning restfulness. Each Purusha residing in the body boundary is a restful unit of consciousness. Purusha is not one, but many. Prakriti is a single entity that extends throughout the universe and is very powerful. In the process of evolution, the three elements of Prakriti are transformed into 24 elements of nature. Here, Purusha is totally detached and inactive observer. 
Sankhya considers Prakriti as the sole creator. Only Prakriti creates this world. Prakriti is also symbolized as a conceiver and a dancer. And is often compared with the personality of a woman. Professor D.P. Chattopadhyaya suggests that the concepts of Sankhya, Yoga and Tantra may have originated from the rituals, principles and fabric of the matriarchal societies of that time. Wearing bangles, this mother goddess is seated in a yogic asan. This shows that Sankhya and Yoga were an integral part of the matriarchic society of Harappa. When the lifestyle of the Harappa people is studied, one finds that yam and niyam of yoga were practiced by these people. The most astonishing fact about this civilization is its abstinence from violence for almost 2,000 years. The yam of yoga brings self-discipline, and it seems that civil discipline was natural to these people, because amazingly, there is no evidence of centralized authoritarian rule. There's no evidence of king or queen, you know, we don't have, you know, palaces in fact in the Harappan level, you know, levels. Probably, you know, it was controlled or maybe administered by a group of people. Like, you know, that is, you know, sort of a democracy, in fact, you know, that the Harappans are introduced. The democracy in this country has survived without any, you know, a, you know any threat. So this is again the important contribution, in fact, of the Harappans. The impression of Hatha Yoga is on the seals. Yam and Niyam are part of their lifestyle. The status of women indicates the Sankhya philosophy. These are the indisputable marks of yoga in the Harappa civilization. With the decline of the Harappa civilization, India moved from the prehistoric period to historical times when the readable literature of the Vedas came into being. To understand the emotions, aspirations and songs of humans 4,000 years ago, Rig Ved is the only document. Rig Ved ki sabse adhik prasiddh richa Gayatri Mantra hai. Aur is Gayatri Mantra mein jo kuch kaha gaya hai, agar usse thik se samajh le, to sara yoga ka vistar samajh mein a jayega. Gayatri Mantra jahan se chalu hua, धीमही ध्यान करें, पूजा करें, नमस्कार करें, ये नहीं है, प्रार्थना करें, ये नहीं है, ध्यान करें, धीमही, किसका ध्यान करें, सविता का, क्रिएटिविटी, सर्जनशीलता, योग का एक प्रयोजन है, व्यवहारिक प्रयोजन है, व्यक्ति की चेतना इतनी जागृत हो जाए कि वो नबीन का सर्जन कर सके। The language of Veda is symbolic. The elements of yoga are found all over its literature. In the Rig Ved, Hiranyagarbha is considered as the primal propounder of yoga. The fierce and wild character of Rudra of Rig Veda remained throughout the later centuries with Yogi Shiva. The character and behavior of the Kesin Munis of the Rig Ved remind us of the later Hatha Yogis. They are called Vatrasna Muni, indicating Nadi Shuddhi and other pranayams. Asta Chakra Navadwara, Deva Nam Pura Yodhya. Innumerable references of technique and philosophy of yoga are found in the Atharva Veda, Brahmans, and Aranyakas. But the first revelation of the word yoga in its classical sense appears in the Tetriya Upanishad and the Kat Upanishad. In Kat Upanishad, it is Yama, the king of death, who reveals the supreme knowledge and yoga together. The human desire of going beyond death is natural ever since our birth and is also the quest of yoga. Upanishads are also called Vedanta, the end portion of the Vedas. Chronologically, they were also written at the end of the Vedas. The Upanishads will be something like 7th century BC and as I explained to you that there are two phases 
द सेश्वरा उपनिषद दिस इज अ टर्म न्यूली कॉइन दिस इज नॉट इन संस्कृत टर्म थीस्टिक उपनिषद कैन बी प्लेस्ड इन द लेटर पीरियड वेर इन रुद्र इज आइडेंटिफाइड विद द फर्स्ट प्रिंसिपल दिस इज वेरी सिग्निफिकेंट बिकॉज सम ऑफ द प्रोटो योग थिंग्स प्रैक्टिसेस विच आर विच आर अंडरस्टूड इन द आरण्य का एंड उपनिषद पोर्शन ऑफ द वेद एज ए होल दे आर ऑल्सो प्री सपोज बाय बुद्धिजम बाय बुद्ध एंड टू सम एक्सटेंट बाय महावीरा Gautam Buddha was born in the 6th century BC in Lumbini in the foothills of the Himalayas. His father King Shudodhan provided him with all the luxuries for his enjoyment and pleasure. But when he discovered the problems of old age, death and disease, everything changed. At the age of 29, leaving behind his wife and son, the prince left home in search of the reality of life. He went deep into the forest. where yogis and ascetics used to practice there in vaishali he met two yogis adar kalam and rudrak ramputra but unconvinced by them he went into isolation to perform rigorous penance so intense was his determination that he put his life in extreme danger but later he abandoned this rigorous practice and arrived at this place and resting his back on the trunk of this peepal tree sat in padmasan he resolved let my body perish but i will not leave this asan without knowing the ultimate reality here the asan finds its ultimate expression as propounded by patanjali he may also have practiced a mudra where the tongue touches the palate which is a form called kechari mudra of medieval hatha yoga at last on the full moon day of the month of vaishakh he attained Nirvana Buddha then sat in one asan for 7 long days enjoying the bliss of liberation Patanjali has described it as Ananda Nugat Samadhi Then through inhalation and exhalation he meditated upon Pratitya Samudpad This is known as Patanjali's Vitarka Nugat Samadhi He then arose, walked and stood here motionless. This place later came to be known as Animesh Lochan without blinking the eyes. For seven continuous days, motionless, without blinking his eyes, he gazed upon his place of enlightenment. In Hatha Yoga, this practice of the blank gaze is known as Tratak and has great significance. Buddha's enlightenment preceded Patanjali. by 300 years as we see here the precise use of asana dhyana and samadhi these sutras show the influence of two shraman traditions the yam and the niyam are influenced by jainism whereas meditation and samadhi have the imprints of buddhism the jain tradition is older than the buddhist its first tirthankar Rishabdev is also mentioned in the Vedas. Rishabdev is also known as Adinath, the first and primal yogi. The first yogi of Hatha Yoga is also called Adinath. Tirthankaras are called Jin because of their victory over the senses. Most of the Jain Tirthankars are shown in the standing posture, Tadasan, leaving the sitting posture, Sukhasan. Patanjali defined Yama as Vrat. self discipline if anyone practices them religiously for life these vrats become mahavrats supreme self discipline perhaps under the influence of jainism patanjali called yama mahavrat the supreme self discipline the world hails the hero the veer who shows prowess in the battlefield but india calls the conqueror of the self mahavir the greatest hero non-violence is the supreme dharma this may be the core ideal of jainism but surprisingly is not found in any of their ancient texts brother slashed the chest of his brother 
to color the hair of his wife with blood, but the outcome of that horrifying war was, non-violence is the supreme dharma. This great saying is found in the Mahabharata. There is no knowledge like Sankhya and no power like Yoga. This saying is also found in the Mahabharata. The Bhagavad Gita becomes part of the Mahabharata, further revolutionizing Yoga. Here, Yoga moves out of the caves and jungles and is used as an indispensable tool to tackle the harsh realities of life. Yoga is considered essential even to win a war, the most horrendous of all acts in life. The Gita is not a philosophical text on yoga, but an inspirational poem. The composer of Gita is passionate about yoga. Each chapter concludes with the word yoga. All the 25 elements of Sankhya philosophy and the eight limbs of yoga are expounded in its 18 chapters. In chapter 6, even the technique of yoga is described. The first five centuries AD are known as the classic age in Indian history in the field of science, philosophy and literature. During this time, a yogi named Vyasa wrote a commentary on Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, which came to be known as Vyas Bhashya. Today, this commentary is the best way to understand the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. These bronze idols are among the best sculptures in the world. In spite of modern techniques, today's craftsmen would find it hard to convey these expressions in their work. There is evidence that the craftsmen used to meditate upon the deity first and then transform their experiences into their work of art. Here, art has a dual purpose. For the craftsman, it is a test of his meditation and for the viewer, the potential for the art to permeate his heart. Therefore, the creation of a sculpture is also a means and a goal for meditation. The experiences of meditation are beyond the senses. To be immersed in meditation, one has to transcend the intellect, because the intellect cannot describe these experiences. 1500 years ago, an unknown yogi created an astounding sculpture here. The experiences of spiritual serenity and grandeur have been personified in this cave. This is the expression of the pure, infinite state of being, the pinnacle of yogic experience, a state of mind that remains unmoved even by the end of the world. Taking the limitations of the human face, the three-dimensional reality of creation, existence and destruction have been expressed on these rocks. That which scriptures failed to convey, a Shaiva yogi unveiled on this rock. In dedication to the first yogi, Lord Shiva, stands the magnificent Kandariya Mahadev temple of Khajuraho. In the temples of Khajuraho, Maya, called illusion in the Vedant, takes the form of the powerful Prakriti of Sankhya. Lazing around in Tamogun, playfully enjoying in Rajogun, and glowing internally in Sattvagun, this is all Prakriti. Her singing, dancing and playing creates surges of emotion.
the whole ambience of the temples resonates with her presence. The presence of Purush here, it seems, is just for company. Here, the statue of Purush is in a state described in Sankhya. The famous thinker Bankim Chandra Chatterjee says that it is the flag of Sankhya, not Tantra, that flies over the temples of Khajuraho. Sankhya believes that every unit of consciousness is an independent entity. And since it is detached and pure, it also has divinity. Therefore, in India it is believed that there are as many gods as there are people. This is the height of spiritual democracy and owes its existence to Sankhya, the philosophy of yoga. But among the presence of millions of gods and goddesses in India, the eminence that Lord Shiva enjoys is enormous. There are Shiva temples all over the country. For the last 5,000 years, Shiva has been worshipped in different forms. From Mount Kailash in Tibet to Rameshwaram in the south, the Hindu mind is influenced by Lord Shiva. On his journey in time and space, Shiva never abandoned the yogic form. In all his temples, we find the Kundalini of Hatha Yoga. At the base of the spinal cord, the Kundalini lies dormant in this way. According to ancient Indian thought, the origin of the universe is from sound. That primordial sound is still resonating in different layers of our consciousness. <laughs> Around 1000 AD, some extraordinary temples were built in a circular shape similar to the chakras. At the center of the temple, there is one deity. On the circumference, there are several. Attached to each deity is an animal, similar to the chakras of Kundalini. These deities are called yoginis, and these temples are known as the yogini temples. An Indian folklore legend has it that he was a great Hatha Yogi who had prolonged his life through yoga and alchemy. Gorakhnath was a disciple of Matsyendranath and Matsyendranath was a disciple of Lord Shiva or Adinath. This is the Matsyendranath temple. This is the Matsyendra Asan developed by Matsyendranath and is said to be very effective in curing diabetes. Inspired by Gorakhnath, Yogi Swatmaram wrote Hatha Yoga Pradipika in the 14th century AD. This text is the quintessence of Hatha Yoga. Hatha Yoga Pradipika mentions 84 major asanas. Bhadrasana, which you saw on the 5,000-year-old Harappa seal, is illustrated in this book. Today, the yoga that has become popular all over the world is really the asanas of Hatha Yoga Pradipika. Hathyog places more emphasis on the purification of the body and its practice begins with the six steps of purification called Shatkarm. The importance given to the physical body by Hathyog and Tantra is truly unique in the history of spirituality. In Hathyog, the human body is seen not as a source of suffering but an effective and reliable tool to eternal life. Since spiritual liberation is possible in this very birth, a healthy body is considered essential towards that end. Sadara. 
पालन सदा रह India in the 18th century experienced caste discrimination, superstition and dogmatism. Later by the end of the 19th century, the British establishment astounded the minds of Indians by the charisma of their literature, knowledge and science. Around the same time, this famous Kali temple was built. Here lived a famous priest called Ramakrishna Paramhansa. He was one of the greatest yogis of the 19th century. It is not a coincidence that he was a devotee of Mother Goddess. Who else would a yogi worship other than Mother Nature, Prakriti? One of the spiritual masters of Ramakrishna was Abhadut Totapuri. Here, Totapuri has ushered Ramakrishna to the last door of complete freedom. But the last door is not opening and Totapuri is perturbed. Dekho Ram Krishna, Tumadet ki sadhana mein एक उंगल भी नहीं बढ़ पाया मेरा धीरज खो रहा है मैं चलता हूं मैं क्या करूं जब भी ध्यान लगाता हूं मां काली की प्रतिमा सामने आ जाती है तो उठाओ तलवार और टुकड़े कर दो काली के वहां कहां से लाऊं वह तलवार काली की प्रतिमा कहां से लाए जिस चित से तुमने प्रतिमा की छवि बनाई है उसी चित से तलवार भी बनाओ and Ramakrishna immersed in Samadhi into the ultimate state of being, free from the last support. It is called Asampragyat Samadhi, the final stage of Patanjali's Ashtang Yoga. Yoga which descended in such perfection that Ramakrishna was a spiritual wonder. He became a Paramhans. Legend has it that when a poor outcast was beaten with a cane, the marks of injury appeared on the back of Ramakrishna. The doctrine of Vedanta says that a single consciousness permeates all of us. We are all but one consciousness. We may have read it in books, but it was visibly evident in Ramakrishna Paramahans. So far, we have completed the 6,000 year journey of the history of yoga, alongside we have also completed yet another journey from searching for yam and niyam in the lives of the peace-loving people of the Indus Valley. We journeyed to the summit of Asampragyat Samadhi. The last support of meditation of Ramakrishna has thus fallen. The triangle of the knower, the knowledge and the known has dissolved. This is the ultimate state of being. Yog is the surest path which arrives at the summit of being, not philosophy, not even science. The experiences in Yog are beyond science, but they are now being quantified and verified by science. This work began when Vivekananda, Ramakrishna's greatest disciple, wrote Raj Yog in the light of modern science. His Raj Yog instilled the desire for freedom in educated Indians, and they started demanding their political freedom. The westward journey of Yog begins in 1893, when Vivekananda traveled to America. From here, the scientific experiments on Yog began. We say that the learned behavior, our cerebral brain, can be completely controlled by our children's behavior. This is the main problem of the human being and the human being of the human being. ये कौन नहीं जानता कि रिश्वत लेना गलत है झूठ बोलना गलत है चोरी करना गलत है हर व्यक्ति को ये मालूम है लेकिन ये ज्ञान हमारे व्यवहार को बदल नहीं सकता क्योंकि ये ज्ञान जाकर के सिर्फ हमारे सेलिब्रल ब्रेन में रिकॉर्ड हो गया है लेकिन जब 
करने का समय आता है तो वो हमारा इंस्टिंक्टिव ब्रेन काम करता है और वो मानता नहीं आपकी बात वो इंडिपेंडेंट है धीरे धीरे हमारे इंटेलिजेंट ब्रेन का कंट्रोल इंस्टिंक्टिव ब्रेन पे नीचे के ब्रेन पे इतना हो जाएगा कि मैं जो सही समझता हूँ वही करूँगा जो गलत समझता हूँ मैं करूँगा ही नहीं लेकिन दुर्भाग्य से इतना विकास होने में कई लाख वर्ष लगेंगे विकास की जो प्रक्रिया है इतनी धीमी है कि बंदर से लेके हमारे मस्तिष्क आने में अब पंद्रह लाख वर्ष लग गए तो एक तो यह है कि हम कुछ नहीं करें हाथ पे हाथ धरे हुए बैठे रहें और इंतजार करें दस पाँच लाख वर्षों में शायद मनुष्य ही देवता बन जाएंगे कोई गलत काम करेंगे ही नहीं बहुत ही अच्छा होगा लेकिन इतना इंतजार कोई कर नहीं सकता तो दूसरा उपाय ये है कि हम योग जैसे प्रक्रियाओं पर ध्यान दें उन्हें और विकसित करें उनका जीवन में उपयोग करें और उससे हम जैसे एक घुड़सवार घोड़े पे बैठा है और एक तो उसके हाथ में कोई लगाम ही नहीं है तो वो क्या करेगा और एक यह है कि उसके हाथ में लगाम दे दी जाए तो वो बहुत कुछ उस घोड़े को नियंत्रित कर सकता है तो योग एक तरह से हमारे इंटेलिजेंट ब्रेन को ऐसी लगाम प्रोवाइड करता है जिससे हम अपने इंस्टिंक्टिव ब्रेन को बहुत हद तक कंट्रोल कर सकते द बिगेस्ट चैलेंज फॉर योग टूडे इज टू रेन इन द अनकंट्रोल्ड माइंड इन दिस एरा ऑफ रैपिड टेक्नोलॉजिकल एडवांसमेंट योग हैज हेल्प कंट्रोल आवर इंटेलेक्ट फ्रॉम टाइम इमेमोरियल एंड हैज एलिवेटेड आवर कॉन्शियसनेस टू अ न्यू हाइट देयरफॉर वी इन इंडिया रिमाइंड आवरसेल्व्स दैट आवर एंसेस्टर्स फॉलोड द पाथ ऑफ योग टू रीच गॉड्स अबाउट महाजनो ये न गता साह पंथा द पाथ ट्रेवल बाय ग्रेट मैन इज द पाथ टुडे द यंगर जेनरेशन इज आल्सो एस्पायरिंग टू वॉक द सेम सेक्रेट पाथ लाइक हथ योगीज दे आल्सो एस्पायर मे द बॉडी रिमेन लाइक गोल्ड फॉर एवर सदा रहे कंचन सीखा काल न कब हूँ